hello everyone. Good evening. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I am really looking forward to seeing your faces appear on the screen, having a conversation and hearing most importantly from our very special guest tonight. So as many of you might know, we have all transitioned, of course, our lives in so many ways. And here on this campaign for US Senate, we are hosting what is our seventh virtual town hall. We think it is more important than ever that anybody who is asking us, people to let us represent them in government has the ability to talk to us. And it's more important than ever during these days of coronavirus that all of us have the ability to communicate. So that's why we're here tonight. Now I know it has been a long, long road for everyone, whether it is our healthcare, our worry about our healthcare and staying safe, whether it is our worry about whether our paychecks will continue or difficulties with filing for unemployment, or even today, as we've seen Governor Mills start to roll out her plan for reopening the economy, I know there are so many concerns from small businesses and the individuals and families who rely on that employment every day. So I look forward over the days and weeks ahead to continuing to talk about those challenges and to address them and deal with them together. But tonight, I am really, really honored and pleased to be able to share this evening with you and to have Paul Tyson here with us. Paul is from Thermoformed Plastics of New England, and they have transitioned. Well, as a matter of fact, they are doing double duty right now, producing what they usually do, but also transitioning to producing face shields. They have donated thousands of face shields to people in Maine, frontline workers, people who are battling this epidemic and virus, emergency first responders, doctors, nurses, and other essential workers. And we are so grateful for the way they've done this. Tonight, we're going to explore a little bit and hear from Paul how his company made that decision to make that transition, what was involved of it, in it, and what it means for both him and all of his employees who are working virtually, it seems, around the clock in order to supply this. Now, why is this so important? It's important because, as we know, the coronavirus is highly transmissible, and we simply have to have enough personal protective equipment available, whether we're talking about doctors and nurses and emergency first responders who have to be able to take care of patients, whether it is any medical emergency or coronavirus specific, they need to be safe and healthy to continue to do that. And also to know that they can go home to their families safely. Now, unfortunately, here in Maine, as well as in states across this country, we're facing a shortage of personal protective equipment. We've seen a number of Maine companies come forward, just like Thermoformed Plastic has, to make a difference in this. But it is still not enough. And to be clear, what we need is a coordinated federal response in order to deal with this. That means, number one, in the absence of leadership that we have not seen, the leadership we haven't seen from the president in this case to coordinate both the production of and then supply chain of PPE, we are calling on Congress to go back into session and to actually pass the, the Medical Supply Chain Emergency Act, which would make sure that that PPE is produced in enough quantity and then actually distributed to states in a way that makes sense. But we also call on Congress to do a couple of other things. Number one, to make sure that states have funding to keep their hospitals open. This is particularly a concern in a place like Maine, where our rural hospitals are struggling every single day. We also call on Congress to give the states more funding to make sure that we can pay for PPE, personal protective equipment, but at the same time to also be able to deal with the many, many needs that are presenting themselves, including needs for small businesses as they continue to stay shuttered during this time. 
So all of that being said, I don't want to continue to just talk to you tonight. I am so, so pleased to introduce Paul to you all. He's going to share a little bit about his business, and then he and I will uh, ask some questions of each other, and then we'll turn this uh, virtual town hall over to you, and everyone can participate and ask questions as well. Uh, so with that being said, Paul, welcome. Thank you for being with us tonight, and hoping you can start by sharing a little bit about your company and your journey during this time of coronavirus. Well, thank you for having me. Um, it was about a month ago that I was working on a Friday and I started getting calls from um, friends asking me if I was going to help make face shields. And I was doing accounting as a small business owner. I get to wear a lot of different hats. I didn't know what a face shield was at the time. So I immediately grabbed my iPad and started Googling it. And I'm like, well, yeah, we can make those. So that weekend I started reaching out to Maine Med and other places to sort of see what the need was. We're fortunate to have a number of medical customers um, that are key to our business. So we know that the specifications of the medical community are, are pretty stringent and they want what they want and they don't want, they don't want just anything. They want, it's gotta work. So um, we started down that road and, and what we were looking to do didn't really seem to have a great fit at that moment. But that moment changed drastically in a couple of days because literally what they didn't want on Monday, they were buying on Thursday. Um, that's how quickly things evolved. And um, so we started a dual approach. One of them was we decided we wanted to um, create the product that we really thought was more appropriate to the medical community. But we also wanted to do something in the short term. So we put out the word to some businesses here in Maine and, and clients of ours and said, if you guys want to make face shields, we can provide the plastic face piece of it and you do the labor to assemble because we don't have the workforce in quantity to do that. And the other thing is, quite frankly, we were very fortunate at the time that this all happened to have a very strong backlog of business. I mean, we were booked solid well through May. Um, I mean, I'm talking solid 50 hours a week kind of solid. So. Um, we quickly had to make a decision how we were gonna handle it. And I reached out to a number of our customers who weren't COVID related. And I said, can you put your business on the back burner for a little bit so we can focus on COVID? And every one of them said yes, mm. which was really heartwarming. And then, we, then my crew came to me and said, well, we gotta, we gotta make some capacity. So they were all willing to work well into the overtime to be able to free up the other jobs that we had to do. So we immediately started going to seven day a week schedules to be able to get the current orders out so we could free up the capacity of the equipment and the, and the personnel, the shift to COVID, which is what we did about two and a half weeks ago. And so for the last two and a half weeks, in addition to running other jobs, we have multiple lines, but we've been running face shields 10 hours a day, seven days a week, um, shipping out 50,000 or so um, a day or pretty close to 50,000 a day. And um, that's going to continue this week and into next week. And then there's, I think, going to be a little bit of a lull. And then we're going to resume, I think, in another couple of weeks with another three or 400,000 that we'll do. So all in, we'll probably do a million face shields in the next, within this five or six week period, as well as everything else we do. Wow, Paul, that's pretty amazing. I mean, you're working 10 hours a day, seven days a week, or you're in production 10 hours a day, seven days a week. I mean, what is this like for your employees and how do they feel about this? They, I would imagine, feel tired, but also a real sense of pride and mission about all of this. Absolutely. They, there are moments when they get a little irritable and I have to spend some time reminding them of the bigger picture. Um, because, you know, we're a small group, we're 15 people. But a couple of weeks ago, we were really struggling with our production goals. And, and a couple of my people came to me and said, I'll work Sunday. Well, we never work on Sunday. And, and we never want people to work that many days. It's not, it's not good health-wise. It's not good safety-wise. It's just not good business. So we've always shied away from that. We try to limit our overtime. Um, but when they, when they offered that up, they said, listen, that's the only way we're going to get to do what we've got to do here. And we got to get this stuff out. And, um, and so that's when we, we, we said, sure. 
And, um, you know, we've done a lot to try and, and motivate them and, and, and that type of thing. We're bringing in meals from them. We, for the guys, we've got um, neighbors, people that live in the community have, have offered and have paid for pizzas to be delivered and other meals to be delivered. So, um, you know, they're feeling the love of everybody, but they also are feeling really good about what they're doing. And, and, and all of them are coming to me saying, well, can I get a box of face shields to give to so-and-so and that type of thing. So they're getting their mark on that as well. Um, and so we, we, we encourage that and embrace that. Yeah. But it's been really heartwarming to see how hard they've been willing to work and um, know how important it is for what they're doing. Paul, I know that in the beginning you were giving some of these products away, but as you have continued, I mean, the numbers that you have actually produced are, are staggering and amazing. Um, how exactly have you coordinated and found those who need to purchase them? And what percentage are in Maine or elsewhere? Um, and have you gotten any help from either the federal government or the state government in that supply chain or in figuring out how to transition your business? Well, we, most of what we're doing is leaving the state, but some of it is coming back because we, we, we've made a deal with the people who are assembling these that we want a certain percentage to come back so that we can continue to give them away. Um, so that's been part of the deal because there are a lot of people who are who are making money in this opportunity and I and I don't I don't like it. I don't agree with it. Um, so we feel very strongly that we need to be continuing the donation piece of things. Mm -hmm. So when we started this, we started with a customer of ours. It's in New Hampshire. They committed to doing a certain number and now they've transitioned back to their regular business. So now we're working with some other people to have them assemble these on our behalf so we can continue to do the giving piece of it. Um, the state's been a big help in the sense that, that through the uh, Manufacturers Extension Partnership, MEP, yeah. they've really been the touchstone for all manufacturers in the state and the medical community to say, what do we need and who can best do it? So every day or so I get emails of, you know, Maine Med wants this or Central Maine wants this or Northern Light wants this. And, um, you know, at some point we were looking at some of those other opportunities and again, because we're a small company with not a lot of extra people, nobody's standing around with nothing to do, we really had to say, what, what's the best use of our time and talent? And clearly, nobody in the state can produce shields at the rate and of the quality that we can. I mean, our equipment is designed for it. So for us to do anything else would have been short-sighted on that end. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't know if this is an easy question to answer, but from where you sit, is there something else that the federal government could be or should be doing to make either production or the supply chain of this flow better? Well, I mean, I don't know what they can do right now, but they clearly need to do something going forward because we can never allow ourselves to be in the situation where we don't have the homegrown capacity to respond to our needs. Um, you know, we compete against China all the time in business. Most of our customers are large corporations, Fortune 500 companies who can buy anywhere. I don't have any problem competing with China. I do it all the time. And typically I win. I don't want to sound like somebody else who talked about winning, but, but we typically do really well in that situation because we're high quality and, and performance based. You know, for four years, we've never missed a shipment on time for a customer, ever. I mean, that's unheard of. What I tell our customers are, you know, if you want to get from China, you know, better make sure you've got some extra stockpiles sitting around. You better make sure you're really on top of some of those things. So the government, I think, really has to look at, at how do we maintain essential manufacturing capacity in this country? You know, if you go back to the Second World War, you know, when we went to war, we were able to design, build, and fly a, a fighters for the Air Force in less than four years. We can't design a toilet seat for, a, for, a, for a, a, a military application in four years in this country right now. So, and so much other stuff is being done overseas. So we really need to streamline some of those processes and we need to really invest in manufacturing because the quality of the jobs are there and the critical nature of what we do is so essential. 
You know, today General Motors is making ventilators. You know, the ability to transition, you know, if you don't have manufacturing, you don't have one of the legs of the economic stool that you have to have to create real wealth and real prosperity in your community. Yeah. Um, really good point. And thank goodness you and others are here, here in Maine and elsewhere across this country and able to make that transition as we need it. But clearly, um, clearly not enough. So Paul, I can see to the left of you um, some models, and I'm wondering if you want to just show us exactly what the product is um, and how it works. So this is the face shield that everybody sort of knows out there. It's your basic screen, piece of foam, elastic band. These are being made all over the country just as fast as they can be. And, you know, that has, um, you know, that, and they're being sold for 3 to $4 a piece. And they're great in one level, but on the other level, there's a lot of work that goes into that that has to then get thrown away when it gets dirty, or you have to spend a lot of time cleaning it and, and that type of thing. So then what we've done is we've developed a version, which is an injection molded headset with a removable piece like this. So then you can turn around and, and replace this and you still have the infrastructure and you buy these for 30 cents or you buy these for $3. Mm -hmm. And so what we wanna do is get these out in a kit form where everybody who has to be in contact with people can have, you know, whether or not you're somebody with um, Best Buy and the Geek Squad who is somebody we're talking to, every one of their people can have a box of these in their car. And when they go on the road to visit somebody, they can have this shield not only to protect themselves, but also to protect who they're visiting. Um, our first responders, you know, the state police, the sheriffs, the firefighters, and not the firefighters so much because they have to have special masks, but people who are interacting with people Everybody should have something like this. The people at Hannaford, you know, should have something like this so that everybody's got a way to protect themselves. So that's the market that we're trying to go to with a kit that's readily available, low cost, um, high quality and reusable. Yeah. Um, that's great. And I'm, I'm really glad. Thank you for showing us those and also for the innovation of coming up with that second model. And also thank you for pointing out that this personal protective equipment is so important, not only for our people who are in the healthcare field, but also for the other essential workers who are out there making sure that the rest of us have access to the things we need, like medicine, like gas, like food. Um, and so uh, I think we are going to see as we continue to go through this pandemic um, over the course of time before a vaccine is created and as we also see our economy reopening that the tools that you are making here, the PPE that you are making will only have more and more value. So. I just want to say I am so impressed. Um, I, if any of your employees are listening, um, and if they're not, please tell them that we say thank you and recognize the incredible work that they've done, but also these hours that are probably feeling very superhuman um, to them and really, really challenging and difficult. We're grateful uh, for your work. Is there anything else, Paul, that you feel that you didn't get to share that you just want people who are tuned in tonight to know? Well, we're, we're committed as a company to, to these products going forward. We're also, I don't know if you can see this, but this is actually a, a piece of fabric that we're, um, we're working with a company to um, form the masks themselves too. So um, we've been doing some prototyping with a, with a colleague in, um, in Ohio that's doing the tooling. So we're gonna start compression molding this into a face mask. Um, the question is, what kind of a level is it gonna have? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know that it will reach the level of Van 95. I'm certainly not an expert in this process, but um, it's another application where our process is ideally suited for it. So we're, you know, we're sort of, um, I don't say tickled, it's kind of a weird word to use at this time, but to think that we as a company um, can be making such a difference in, in so many ways and with this virus. And we're also working with Maine Med on a, on a design that they've developed, which is a tent that goes over patients to help contain them mm -hmm. um, so that they're not uh, spreading that. So we're um, working with them on a prototype or, or another level prototype of that product for them. 
So we're spending a lot of time in the COVID world, something I never, never thought I'd be doing a month ago, but it is heartwarming work to be doing and we're grateful for the opportunity to be able to do so. That's great. Um, well, Paul, I think you're doing what Mainers do best and what Maine small businesses do best, do best, which is innovating and rising up to meet the challenges in front of us. And I think that's what you mean when you say you're tickled to be doing it, that this is what makes you tick, um, rising to those challenges and meeting needs uh, and innovating in the way that I think is just invaluable and so important right now. So thank you for being on with us and sharing the story of your incredible company and employees. And thanks for the work that you do. And can't believe that you're continuing to uh, produce all of your other goods at this manufactured goods at the same time. Pretty amazing. I hope to see you in person soon. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks. Okay, so um, for folks who are here with us tonight, now we're going to turn to the portion of our evening where those of you who are here and have questions or uh, comments um, are able to do so. So as a reminder, what Tim told you at the beginning was that you can go to the bottom of your screen and press the raise your hand icon and uh, we will get to as many questions as we can during the time that we have. But if you do that um, and just keep doing it every time somebody has had a question and had it answered, um, hopefully we'll get to every single one of you this evening. While we're waiting for that first person to raise their hand and come on screen, I, I see we have somebody with us. Hi, how are you? And all, I just want to ask for the benefit of everybody watching, as you come on screen, could you introduce yourself and also where you are from? Oh, hi. Hi, Sarah. Hi, how are you, Ina? Fine, thank you. My name is Ina and I live in Wiscasset. Um, thank you for giving me this opportunity to ask my question. Okay, here okay. is my question. Uh, what will you do to ensure that people with pre-existing conditions will continue to have access to affordable healthcare? Okay. The reason I ask is because I'm very concerned with the prices of medication that keeps going up, benefiting the pharmaceutical companies because I have pre-existing condition and I need to have coverage, especially as I also am aging. <laughs> so I'm also glad that to hear that you are addressing the current health need in such a strong way especially when you are also featuring someone from Biddeford, here from Maine, locally. I really am glad about that. And yes, I know that the, we need the personal protective equipment badly. So would you like me to repeat my question since I no, thank you, Ina. Uh, I, I wrote it down and also imprinted it on my memory. So first of all, thank you for joining us tonight. And thank you so much for your very, very important question. And the question is about pre-existing conditions. And overall, I think healthcare coverage that is accessible to everybody and affordable to everyone. But let me add one more thing that I think that that healthcare coverage needs to also be quality, excellent coverage as well. So first of all, as we all know, in the Affordable Care Act, there was this requirement that people with pre-existing conditions are covered by health insurance. And as we all unfortunately are also acutely aware, that Affordable Care Act is in extreme jeopardy right now. It is because of the Trump tax bill that was passed in 2017. And in fact, Senator Susan Collins was one of the deciding votes on that bill. Now, as all of us watch the Affordable Care Act bounce back and forth in those higher courts, here in Maine, we looked at each other and said, what will we do about this? Because we know that so many of us have those pre-existing conditions and need to know that our healthcare will be there. 
So we actually passed a law in Maine so that here in Maine, we know if we have a pre-existing condition, no matter what happens in a federal courtroom or in a congressional vote to repeal, we know that Mainers with pre-existing conditions will still be covered. Look, when we're talking about health care in our state, in any state, at the federal level, we need to know that every single person in this country has access to health care that we can afford. It has to be our number one priority because health care is a basic human right. And that is what I will fight for in the United States Senate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm glad you added that quality part because, you know, it's important that even if we are old, we still want to live too. Yes. Yes. Ina, I'm so glad you're with us. Nice to Thank see you. you. Take care. Yeah, you too. Thanks. Okay, so as a reminder, if you have a question, please go to the bottom of your screen and press the raise your hand button. I can see that we have somebody coming online with us right now. And it looks like Dan is here with us. Hi, Dan. Hi, Sarah. Can Hi, Sarah. It's Dan Sayer from Kenny Bunk, it's good to see you again. Um, I, and I was delighted to see that you had a local small business uh, uh, leader from York County on tonight. And it's really exciting to see what uh, an innovative company here in Maine is doing um, to, to address COVID. I have an economic question for you. Maine has the oldest population in the country and we lose a lot of our young people who seek jobs out of state. And it's a double whammy for our economy uh, because it means we have more seniors who need uh, services uh, from the state and fewer working people generating taxes to fund those services. So my question is, what will you do as a senator to help grow Maine's economy and keep our young, help keep our young adults in state and attract entrepreneurs and jobs to our state? Yeah. Um, Dan, thank you so much for this question. And this is something that I spend a lot of time thinking about from a couple of different perspectives. Number one, from the perspective of a parent of three kids who I hope very much will have the chance to make the choice to stay here in Maine or to come back to Maine to grow their own um, uh, futures and careers and families. But as you said, this is a real problem for us right now. Not only are we demographically the oldest state in the country, but we literally don't have enough people to fill our jobs. Now, when I say that, I am talking about what we looked at pre-coronavirus. Clearly, we are in at least a temporarily different state right now with a high number of unemployment and businesses shuttered. But ultimately, our path to the future has to include a robust economy and a, uh, a state that is filled with people of all ages, including young people and growing families. I think that there are a number of ways that we need to focus on doing this. First of all, I think we need to start with the understanding that people in Maine, we want them to stay here if they grow up here or to have the chance to stay here. And that starts with affordability of higher education. Whether we're talking about a two-year or four-year degree, whether we're talking about training programs and really embracing training programs for many of the jobs that we have here and need to fill, that is absolutely a first step we need to take. We also need to make sure that Maine is an attractive place for people to live. And by that, I mean one that is going to support them and their families. We need to have infrastructure in the state that is modern and that allows people to do any kind of work. That means, yes, traditionally what we think of in terms of infrastructure, modern roads and bridges, but it also means simple things like infrastructure digitally, making sure that we've got broadband and high speed internet, no matter where you live in the state, that when you're driving from place to place on your cell phone, uh, 
you know, hand free, of course, that you're able to do so without dropping a call. Um, these are basic things, but they are incredibly important. And whether we're talking about investments that come on the state level or making sure that we are leveraging investments from the federal level for a rural state like Maine that sometimes lacks the resources to do it ourselves, this is incredibly important and uh, it's what we need to focus on for the future. Great, thank you. Thank you, Dan. Uh, okay, so while we're waiting for our next person to come on board, I like to just point out uh, something that is a great need in the state right now, which is we need more blood um, for medical procedures. So if you are capable of donating blood, please go to the American Red Cross page to see how you can safely do so during this time. And I see our next person has joined us on the screen. Hi. Oh, you are muted right now. Are you able to unmute yourself? Okay, perfect. Hi, so Allie. Uh, yeah, I'm Allie Gardner and I'm calling from Orono. Um, thanks for your time this evening. And I wanted to know, could you speak about um, what you would do to support the University of Maine system and higher education fiscally in light of the combination of the nationally declining undergraduate enrollment rate, as well as the COVID-19 pandemic? Yes. Um, thank you, Allie. First of all, nice to see you and meet you. Thank you for being here with us tonight. And this is a question actually that we um, have thought about for years and years in the legislature, how we support our higher education system, both the University of Maine system, but also the community college system as well. What we know is that these uh, higher education institutions do an incredible job of educating Mainers, but A, we need to make sure that they are able to do so offering all of the educational programs that are not only appealing to people, but we need people to be educated in in order to fill jobs in this state. Um, and we need them to be able to do it in a way that is affordable here to people in Maine. And that also, going back to Dan's question, will continue to draw more young people to Maine to study so that they can then make the choice to live here. Look, the long and short of it is we need to invest in ourselves and investing in education, whether it is early education, K through 12 education or our higher education institutes has a tremendous return on investment. And it's where we need to focus ourselves. We need to make sure that we are modernizing the infrastructure at the University of Maine system because when we talk about kids either who are from Maine or kids who are from out of state thinking about coming here, you can be sure that they are visiting and looking at engineering um, labs and other facilities and making the choice about where they are going to be able to learn the best. And if we want to be the best and draw the best and keep the best here, then we've got to be competitive in exactly that way. Thank you, it's nice to meet you. Thanks, Allie. Nice to meet you too. So it looks like we have somebody just about to come on the screen here. And while we do, I just want to say something that we should all be saying every single day. I know in New York City, people go out at 7 p.m. Uh, they open their windows or go onto their balconies to say thank you to the frontline workers in the healthcare community. So I just want to echo, I think on behalf of all of us, our thanks to those doctors and nurses and first responders out there. Um, hi there. I think I saw that your name is Brianna. Hi, Sarah. I'm really, really proud of you. And honestly, you're doing a phenomenal job. Uh, the only thing I wanted to do was just discuss with you that some people are concerned that Senator Collins may be a little bit better at this only because she's been there for a while. So I just want you to address to those people why you are just as able to get stuff done, even though you are a junior senator. <laughs> okay, Brianna, first of all, thank you. Thank you for your support and um, kind words. And listen, I always say a couple of things that when I am introducing myself to people and asking them to believe in me and to trust me as their next U.S. Senator, 
that they can look to the past in order to understand exactly what kind of person I will be and Absolutely. how I will represent us and stand up for us there. You know, my years in the state house were unquestionably some of the most challenging years that we have ever seen in Maine state government. In fact, my first two years as speaker were Paula Page's last two years as governor, and we were operating in very closely divided government in the legislature, a Republican controlled Senate, a democratically controlled house that I was in charge of. And so every day it was an exercise in how we bring people together in order to get things done. And that's exactly what we did again and again. I'm really proud of that work. And I think that is the hallmark of who we are and should be as human beings and who we should be when we are working in government. That's why we were able to pass legislation that really started to turn the tide in the opioid crisis. Not only did we save lives, literally, but we also have finally started to both prevent um, substance use disorder and to treat people in the short and long term with substance use disorder. We additionally were able to come together in bipartisan efforts to lift people out of poverty and create pathways to success for them for the future with training programs, education programs, and wraparound services that were completely bipartisan, but also served the dual purpose of making sure, again, I'm going back to Dan's question, that we were dealing with some of our workforce issues and actually moving people into the economy that would continue uh, to keep us churning in a really positive way. Look, what I think and what I know about myself is that if you're willing to listen and if you are willing to sit down with the people that you think you disagree with the most, it is always still possible to get things done. And that's exactly what I'm going to do in the United States Senate. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks, Brianna. Nice to meet you. So as we are uh, waiting for our next person to come on, I just want to mention, if you didn't already see, that Governor Mills did at a press conference today begin to unveil her plans to reopen the economy. I think there are probably many questions about that out there. I still myself have some questions that I am learning um, exactly what the details are on. But what I do want to say is that I think we have to continue to prioritize public health and safety, but we also need to make sure that we are thinking about exactly what we can do to mitigate the financial impacts for people and to actually boost up our economy and our small businesses and the people, individuals and families who rely on them in this time. Okay, hi, how are you? Hi, Sarah. Hi, how are you? Good. It's good to see you. Um, I guess my question is a, is a shorter term one. Um, I am really horrified when I read that uh, farmers are trashing food because they have no way to get to their, their markets because if they were restaurants or schools or whatever, mm -hmm. and that food banks at the same time are running out of food. I mean, that, they, there's, there's a logistical issue in there that somebody has got to be able to solve. And, and so my question, I guess, is, is somebody working on that at the state level? And are you aware of anything that we as individuals or we as municipalities can do? Yeah. Um, so Irene, thank you for that question. Such an important question. And I think it's important, um, you know, in answering that to note that there's something different happening in Maine than there is happening on the federal level here. I think right now we're seeing small farms and small farmers um, uh, have, having a way to make sure that they're not only able to sell curbside, but that they're able to distribute their food in various ways and to get it out throughout the state. I think the real problem that we are seeing is larger farms across the country running into the problem that you're having and all of this food going to waste at the same time that we know that people are going hungry in this country. 
and that is unconscionable. The answer is, and this is a similar answer to what we have talked about in some other instances tonight around both testing and personal protective equipment, is that there has to be an entity that coordinates, that understands need state by state, and that understands supply state by state, and that is coordinating that. Both the production, the growing of the food, excuse me, and then the actual supply chain chain to get that food out everywhere. Reasonably speaking, the only entity that is really capable of doing that is the federal government, but it takes leadership to do it. And right now that leadership is lacking. And if the president and the administration, his administration are not going to do it themselves, then the United States Congress needs to come in and find a way to make sure that it happens. Right now, for example, there is, as I mentioned before, regarding personal protective equipment, a bill, one sponsored by Senator Angus King in the Senate, one sponsored by Representative Shelley Pingree in the House, that's called the Medical Supply Chain Emergency Act. We need something like that also for food production. And we simply cannot let this food go to, go to waste and ruin. And we cannot allow people in this country to be hungry. That, by the way, is an imperative for us before coronavirus and after it as well. I guess I was just thinking in the absence of that federal leadership, um, whether chains like Hannaford could serve as the distribution to the food chains, you know, whether they could, you know, if, I mean, if the farmers aren't going to make money off it anyway, better to donate it than trash it, right? Yes, I do think that is right. Uh, and, and as for the question of how some of the larger chains might be able to help, I don't know the answer to that, but I think that it is definitely worth exploring. And I am going to literally write it on my list right now. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Irene. Hi there. So I see, can see you, but you're on mute right now. Okay, it looks like you're unmuted. Hi, Steve. Hi, Sarah. My name's Steve Painter. I'm calling from Kennebunkport. I wanted to ask you a question about healthcare. Can you talk a little bit about how you fought to defend access to affordable healthcare, particularly for people with pre-existing conditions? Yeah, absolutely. So um, hi, Steve. Thank you for joining us. It's nice to see you tonight. And this is something that, look, I think when we saw the Affordable Care Act go into law, all of us across this country looked around and said, so many of us have pre-existing conditions, and this is absolutely long overdue. And yet we find ourselves in the place right now here in Maine and across the country where that coverage is in jeopardy because the Affordable Care Act is in jeopardy in the courts. And that, of course, and I know I already mentioned this tonight, so I'm sorry to repeat myself, but that is because of the 2017 Trump tax bill that was passed. Now here in Maine, and this is something that in that people can do state by state, legislatures can do state by state. In 2019, our very first bill of the session, LD1, was a bill to put the core provisions of the Affordable Care Act into law. So in Maine, we know that even if we have a pre-existing condition, we'll still be covered by health insurance. Beyond that, we also know that our children are going to be on our health or able to be on our health insurance until they're 26, that seniors can't be charged more just before, just because of their age. Um, this to me is a critical part of what we need to do as lawmakers, how we stand up for individuals, and it is what I will do for us in the United States Senate as well. Well, that's excellent. Thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you, Steve. I appreciate it. Bye. 
So while we're waiting for, it looks like Eileen is going to be joining us. Um, I just want to say if you are having any issues accessing resources at this time, you can go to sarahgideon.com and look at the bottom of the page and click on the bar that says COVID-19. There is a, an ability to connect you to all sorts of resources um, through that way. And we really want to be here and be helpful in this time. Hello. Hi, Eileen Horton in Saco. Hi, Eileen. How are you? I am great. Um, I'm wondering, we see so much of uh, Susan Collins with her hard head on at BIW, et cetera, and doing all these wonderful things for the state of Maine by bringing businesses, contracts, et cetera, to, to us. Um, can you talk a little bit about your relationship with some of these industries and how you would uh, compete against that for us. Yeah, absolutely. So Eileen, thanks for that question. I think it's a really important one. And I think that there can be um, a mistaken belief that only one senator is able to bring home the proverbial bacon. When I think about the history of the people who have re represented us in Maine in the United States Senate, I think of people like Senator Mitchell. I think of people like Senator Cohen. I think of people like Senator Snow, who have a long and rich tradition of working hard to represent all of us here in Maine. And that is one that I will absolutely continue in the United States Senate but very similar to the way in which I have done it in the Maine State House, making sure that we are investing in municipalities, lowering property taxes, putting investments into broadband and infrastructure and growing our economy and our workforce and workforce training. Look, in terms of the Senator, Senator Collins, you know, all through this campaign until really coronavirus descended on us and we've been talking mostly about coronavirus we've had this one question that has been asked of us over and over again it's people saying what do you think happened to her it seems like she's different than she used to be it seems like she is representing some interest, but it's not our interest here in Maine. And I think that really gets to the heart of the issue. What people in Maine can know is that I will stand up for them, whether it is access to health care, whether it is bringing home grants and funding and investments in our companies, in our infrastructure, and I will be standing up for the voice and lifting the voice of Mainers, not of special interests. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks Eileen. Mm. So while we're waiting for our next person to uh, come forward, um, I just want to say thank you to all of you for doing your part during coronavirus. I know it is not easy to make all the changes that we have, to stay at home, to um, you know, really disrupt our lives, but it has made a difference. When we look at the number of cases in Maine and the number of hospitalizations, the number of deaths and how much lower they are than in other places, I think it has to do with this behavior that we've been able to demonstrate. And so I want to say thank you for that. Hello, how are you? Uh, Brad Hart, I live in Pittsburgh. Um, thank you, uh, Sarah, for having this uh, uh, Zoom meeting. I think it's a great, uh, great way to do things in today's world. Um, my question is this, if we look at Congress, okay, and we look at the deadlock that's been there for years and years, if we look behind the scenes a little bit upstream of this, we see that a lot of the issues are because certain people have been there their entire lives or most of their professional lives. If we look at McConnell, he's been there forever. If we look at Susan Collins, she's been there since 1997. And it seems like the longer a senator or a congressman is there, the more they become addicted to power as opposed to dealing with what the needs are from their state and their constituents. And I think I've come to the conclusion that, and I don't know how it can be done, 
that we need term limits, even though there are people that are in there that have been there for many years and are still doing a fantastic job. Unfortunately, there seems to be a cancer in that so many of them become addicted to power and it doesn't matter. Party is more important than the constituents that they're supposed to represent. And I wonder what you have uh, in the way of your feelings on that particular topic. Brad, thank you for that question. So let me start by saying what I think is the most important thing. And that is that when we represent people on any level of government, our focus should always remain on people and we should always be accessible to them. Now, whether that is through a virtual town hall like this or literally having town halls throughout the state and in every county, I think that's really, really important. Um, I do also agree, Brad, that what we see when people remain in certain elected positions year after year after year, is that they become more disassociated from the people they represent, but also that they are able to amass this power. And we absolutely do see it, for example, in Senator Mitch McConnell. You know, he said, for example, just the other day that he'd rather see states go bankrupt than to give any more support from the federal government. I can't think of anything that is more out of touch than that. But I'll also share with you, so I don't know if you are, you know this, but I've been in the state house for eight years. So that means actually I'm term limited at this time. And, you know, my experience with term limits has been uh, a couple of different things I'll share with you. So first of all, I think if it wasn't for term limits, um, that I certainly never would have become speaker of the main house of representatives, because I think probably somebody would have remained speaker for 20 or 30 years. In fact, we can look at other states that don't have term limits, and that's exactly the model we see. I think there are benefits to term limits. I think there are also significant drawbacks to term limits, and they really worry me, and I want to share with you what those are. I think that when we have term limits in place, that the people who then amass all the power, because make no mistake, somebody will become the lobbyists or maybe even staff. And that means that the voter no longer has any control over the people who have the real knowledge about how things are done, the institutional knowledge, and who are actually getting things done and making decisions. And to me, that feels very scary. So what I really believe is that there should be term limits, but that the term limits are supposed to be determined by the voters and that it is our responsibility to be paying close attention, to be demanding of our elected representatives that they are accountable to us, that they are listening to our voices and that they are taking our voices to whatever place in government they are. And that when they don't, that they should be term limited out by being voted out. So that's where I stand. I know that was a long answer, but I felt it was necessary to explain that I do have the same concern about people being in a place for too long and the power that comes with that and the way they stop really representing us. But I want to make sure that that, that those who are getting things done or not done remain accountable to the voters. And that's what worries me about term limits. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, everybody, we have time for one more question here. So as a reminder, if there is one more question, you can just go to the bottom of your screen and I see, it looks like one more person has raised their hand and Al Huntley is going to be coming on the line. Hello. Hi, Sarah. Hi, how are you? You're fine, Hi, thank, thank you. you. And thank you for doing these. Uh, they're always informative and thank you. Thanks. My question is also a healthcare question because given all the people who've become unemployed, recently um 
and your interest in creating a public option for healthcare, but you also wanted to make sure that there was a private option too. So if people had were employed and had insurance, mm -hmm. uh, they could keep their current insurance. Um, I think a lot of the people that were in that situation and are now unemployed might not be so enchanted with the idea of having uh, private insurance. How do you feel about that now? Yeah, so it's a very good question and valid question to ask. And I constantly ask of myself, coronavirus or not, to reevaluate where we are in the world, what's happening for people, and what the right policy solutions are to help us and to move us forward and make progress. In the case of healthcare, I think, first of all, that this coronavirus has laid bare all the inequities that exist in terms of healthcare. Absolutely. I also think to myself, thank goodness that we were actually able to create and implement Medicare, excuse me, Medicaid, no, Medicaid. <laughs> and now 60,000 more people have health insurance. Yes. I have asked myself that same question about the public option and if I still think it's the right thing. And, you know, we know that I think it, the, the latest statistic this week is here in Maine, one in seven people are unemployed right now. But that being said, I do still think that having an option available for anybody to buy into Medicare that wants to do so is the right thing to do. But I still believe and think that there are people who have or will have, again, private insurance that prefer to have that option. And I do not want to take that option away from people. And I do think, and I want to emphasize this, that opening up Medicare for everybody who wants to buy into it, you know, does create, um, you know, the, the public option that I think is really important for us. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that question. And I know that was our last question for the evening. I want to close tonight by thanking you again for joining us. I think it is so important that we continue communicating with each other, hearing from each other personally as both Speaker of the House, but somebody running to represent us in the United States Senate. It is vitally important to me that I continue to understand what's happening for all of us, no matter where we live in this state, and that we are using our voice on this campaign to lift up the issues and to ask that the federal government take responsibility and show leadership in the ways that we have been asking for for months and months. The fact that we still don't have enough personal protective equipment, that we don't have enough tests, that state by state we are looking about, looking at or talking about opening our economies without enough tests in place, without contact tracing, widespread and universal being available to us, is pretty scary for all of us. We are in a national crisis and we need national leadership and every single one of us needs to continue to ask for that. I know that I will and I know that I only become more determined every day about the way that I want to be a leader in the United States Senate and the way that I want to make sure I represent what we need here in Maine. So thank you for being a part of this. I look forward to seeing you maybe on the screen again, definitely at some point in the future in person again. Stay safe, be well, take care of each other. Thanks.